I want to build a 3D scene in Fusion with accurate camera movement, lighting and shadows that match live action footage. Welcome to a tutorial about 3D camera tracking in DaVinci Resolve or Fusion Studio. This is the second tutorial in my series about my quest to bring a spaceship into drone footage. And if you followed along so far, you can just continue from, from last week's uh, result. Or if not, you can just download the tutorial files from my website and you can just do the camera tracking as a standalone uh, tutorial and can just uh, follow along from there. So 3D camera track, lights and shadows, let's get started. I have here the spaceship from Igor Pushkaric, which I prepared in the previous lesson. If you just want to try the tracking and don't care about this part, you can just use any 3D object, just a shape 3D or text 3D or so. Uh, but if you follow along everything, just start from here. And here I have my wind farm drone footage. The original one is here is an H.264 encoded Ultra HD video. And H.264 is bad for editing and worse for compositing. So since I will be using this sequence a few times, uh, I, I want to use something more optimized for editing and compositing. And I rendered out myself a EXR sequence for this. If you use DaVinci Resolve, you would just use optimized media. Uh, if you are using Fusion Studio, you can just use the saver node and just once render the scene into something uh, better, like at least like a ProRes or DNX HD version, something like this. I'll check if I can provide a different file as well in the exercise files. Um, but if you want, you can even go for uncompressed, which I'm doing here, or, or very low compression, uh, like these EXR files. And uh, in this case, you get huge files, like this sequence is 6 gigabyte, but just for the 360 frames. Uh, but I only need them while I'm working on this particular shot and afterwards it goes to trash and I've just rendered this out so I can work efficiently on this. With this setup, I want to now bring the Starship into the moving drone footage. Let's have a look again, actually not at the ship, but at the footage. And you see the camera is moving in and, and to the side. And my ultimate goal is to place the ship somewhere here at the beginning and then take off, fly around this wind turbine and fly out of the frame. And I want the, uh, first of all, I want the camera movement uh, accurate from the real camera movement so that I can focus only on the like physical movement of the ship, but don't have this uh, superimposed movement of the drone. And the second part that I want, I want to make sure that the shadows are matching. So I will in 3D put a plane, which I use only to, to capture shadows. And I want to make sure that my lights are matching the shadows I see here, especially this shadow. So my first step will be to create a simple 3D scene with just a pillar where I can, can check how this shadow is being casted and where I need to put the light to get uh, the same direction of shadow. So that will be my first task. Let me create the camera track. Now, this part will only work in Fusion Studio, I should mention, or in DaVinci Resolve Studio, but not in the free version. The free version doesn't support the 3D camera tracker. If you are following along with the free version, you can still use my solution files and you can use the, the camera that I'm uh, exporting. Um, so you can still use this and I will show you once I'm there, but you will not be able to do the tracking itself in the free version. First things first, the camera track. So from the control spacebar menu, camera tracker, here it is. Let me add it and bring it into the view and maybe into single view for now. So first I am identifying, or Fusion is identifying features that can be tracked throughout the image, throughout the sequence. And then afterwards it's using those to do some calculation and determine uh, the, the camera position based on, on those features. So if to see them, uh, usually it's nice to click on darken and click on preview auto track locations. So this way I can see the features that uh, Fusion determined by default. 
And you're looking for a good spread, especially in perspective, in, in depth. So you, you want to see some in the foreground and some in the midground and a few in the backgrounds. And that will, that will mean that um, there's a chance to get that, that camera position accurate. If you have only in the background, if you have like a lot on the horizon but not much here, that would be a problem. Also a bit of spread left and right would be nice, but there are limits to this image. So here you have these, these planes or these fields, they don't offer a lot of contrast, so there won't be a lot of features. Um, you can think about which channel you want to get these features from. So right now it's taking the luminance to identify points of high contrast that can be uh, tracked throughout. If I look at the image uh, in, let me turn this off for a second, so this is in the color channel, red channel, green channel, blue channel, you actually see red channel uh, looks less you see less contrast than in green and blue. In blue, well, the sky is just uh, white, but the sky doesn't have features anyways. So, but the rest of the image here has more contrast in the blue channel. So you might as well um, use the blue channel for, for the tracking. Luma channel will also work, but you might get a, a bit more out of, uh, of the blue channel perhaps. Another thing is if you want more points, you can work with these two parameters. The first one uh, determines uh, how much contrast is enough contrast. So if you don't have enough points, you can reduce it and you will see a few more points popping up because now areas with less contrast are being considered by Fusion. However, those points may also be less accurate in some cases. So there's a trade-off. Uh, what might be better is the minimum feature separation. So if you do have a spread out of points, if you have points in the foreground and in the background, um, by reducing the minimum feature, uh, Fusion is able to add more points in this area and this will increase the accuracy. Uh, so if you don't have points at all, it won't, it won't help. But if you have some points and you just uh, can afford the additional calculation time and if, you're, if your processor is good enough, you might just add more points by reducing those uh, minimum feature separation. And this way here, I'm getting significantly more points and they will, if, if they are still solid and by, with the detection threshold, uh, I can make sure they are still on, on high contrast areas, I might get a bit of a better solution. I might rather increase the detection threshold if my spread of points is still, still good, but in, instead uh, de decrease this uh, feature separation. Um, now, now not, not too low, but uh, some, something like this, and then you have to experiment what still uh, is, is feasible and workable um, for you. But again, you only need to run this once, so let me do this. Let me actually run this now. And depending on your machine, this may take uh, a few seconds or a few minutes. And if it's really way too slow for you, uh, don't go, go that far, just use a bit less. And actually, I, I hope to get a pretty good track out of this, but if you have uh, not the optimal track for this scenario, it will still be okay because I'm not trying to place any solid objects into the scene. I just want my spaceship to fly through the scene and I want my shadows accurate. But if I have a little bit of inaccuracy in the camera, it will probably, the final result will probably be tolerant in this example. It's different if you want to place like buildings into the scene, which you really need to stick to the ground. So in that case, you, you need a very good track uh, for the example here. Uh, probably I don't need to uh, overwork myself here on, on the tracking. It finished. Let me work through these tabs. So camera tab, unfortunately I have no clue about the camera at all. So the only thing I can do here is take the defaults and, and uh, skip it. If you do know uh, sensor details and the focal length, this can, can help the solver. It can make the solution a bit better. Um, if you don't know, only option is to, to skip. Then I have here my, my solve area and I, I usually just start with, with the defaults. Uh, I also refine the focal length because I don't know what the focal length is. So I can start with this and just click on solve. And it will take again a little bit of time, probably a little bit more than the, the tracking itself because now it's, it's doing the heavy calculation of uh, determining, well, the, the, the position of the camera out of these uh, 2D tracking points. 
Okay, for me it took like two or three minutes, but uh, if, if it takes way too long, again, you have to uh, reduce the, the number of points. So this is really a lot of points that I'm using here. Uh, let's have a look. So first of all, it says here focal length 18.9. That is what Fusion determined. So if I do any improvements further down, I can guess that probably this camera had not an 18.9 millimeter lens, but probably an 18 millimeter lens. So I will just enter it in the focal length. And if I do any refinements, I will just disable it here and, and just use, use 18 now. Uh, and, and probably that is uh, right. Then I can look at these points. If you want, there are both automatic or like semi-automatic and manual ways to Im improve on this even further. So let me, so if you want, you could filter a bit by, uh, by the arrow, you also see color indicators for which points um, Fusion thinks are great and which point it has problems with. And for example, all these red points here, this makes a lot of sense to me because uh, it is trying to get a contrast between the foreground and the background here if you are on these lines. And that usually doesn't make sense So because you know the perspective will change. So if the contrast is between a foreground and a background, um, then these points cannot be cannot be very good. So you might as well uh, delete these, or if you want, you can even even check now in in 3D what Fusion came up with. If I add a 3D merge, and now let me maybe go back to a color view and you have two outputs from this camera tracker. One of them goes into 3D. And if I go into 3D now, you can see where these points are and can uh, mark points and check even with 2D. Let's go back into um, here in 2D. Let's enable the high contrast again and see where these points are. So if I, if I select these, for example, um, they, if I select points here, they are you should see them highlighted here, no? Oh yeah, okay, so there are quite a lot, so it's a bit um, difficult to see. Maybe I overdid it a li little bit with the number of points, um, but still you can kind of see where these points are. So there are a lot of points here on the top. I definitely want some here, even though there's a lot of red as well. Um, and then you have a lot of points down here, which is the ground, which is great. So I'm, I'm looking especially at this because this is like my, my main foreground object here and also important uh, for me to get this shadow. Um, but then I see some points here in the middle and they're like floating. This makes no sense at all, these points. Um, like like floating between the floor and the, the top in the back. And this is probably related to these. So here I can see in 3D, I can just, you know, these all uh, don't make make sense at all. So uh, let me go here. So here, if, if I know that these points are not good, I can also delete them directly from here. Probably all of these, uh, maybe the green ones here on the side, perhaps there's something which is good, but likely uh, these points don't make sense. And now you see the, the new points coming. Um, and here we have the same problem. So these points probably don't make much sense. And if you like, you can adjust it a little bit. Now, probably I can just continue with my solution the way I have it already. Uh, but if you do need to refine, so these are the kind of things that you can do. Um, again, chances are that these points are, are not the best here. Uh, you can also filter or remove some of these red points. And just by a little bit of manual intervention like this, I probably can improve my, my solution a little bit. Okay, so with a few points selected, let me run the solve again. Uh, but honestly, this is just fine tuning for demonstration. Now, the accuracy that I got from the first solve is probably already sufficient for um, what, I, what I want to do in, in this tutorial. Okay, improved solve, improved solution. And now I have a look at the solve error again. Now I have a solve error 0.22. Wow, this is excellent. Uh, everything below one is already good and below 0.5 or so we're we are getting in really good track. 0.22, I, I didn't expect it to be that low, but uh, wow, this is excellent. So now I feel confident about the track and won't worry much about the solver anymore and about the rest of the fiddling that you could do here uh, and instead create my 3D scene. Next part here, I can click on export 
and if I click export here it will now give me it will now create a 3d scene for me and usually it appears in my flow in the worst possible place uh, oh yeah okay it appeared here let me uh, move that into somewhere where I can can see it okay let me see what I have here I have my let me bring the merge into both views actually and I see here my my camera which is animated now and moving towards my point cloud which is good I have the point cloud itself and I have a ground plane which I see here as a wireframe. Now the first thing I need to do is place the ground plane so that it actually matches the ground and this will help me a lot for placing other elements in the scene later. So here the ground is luckily really uh, flat. I have a flat plane so I can, uh, this should be easy. Um, the view I want to use for this, I want to look at the 3D camera view uh, in the 3D viewport on the right and in the perspective view on the left so you can always change here right click camera front left etc so you can change the the 3d view option so i have my 3d perspective view here and the exact camera view on the right and now i can if i select points here i can see them highlighted here as well and this can really help me with the orientation in my 3d scene um, but before I do this, I don't like these crosses, especially if I have a lot of points. So instead of cross, you can just do points. So sometimes it's a bit more precise. And also the color is coming from the solver. So based on the solve error before, I don't really need this. So I disable the per point color and just keep it white, which I find a bit um, cleaner. If you like, you can also change the size of these points. Um, but uh, I guess that's, that's fine. Now I want to place the ground plane and I want to place it, let me mark the points which I think are relevant. So all these points here are definitely on the ground and here these points, let me shift select those, they are also definitely on the ground um, and, and these here and these. Um, uh, actually even the, the horizon uh, would be fine but I need the plane like in this area because this is where I want to uh, let my starship take off and then fly through so this area here will be all relevant for the starship and for the shadow that I'm placing. So now I have those marked and I have a reference here in the scene where these are. So now I place the uh, 3D plane uh, so that it goes through these points. Uh, the ground plane here I can use it directly what I have here. Um, to place it often it's easier to have a pivot point on, on one end rather than in the middle because then I can easier uh, scale and rotate. So let me do that first in the ground plane here. I move the pivot point um, down to one end which is uh, green Y and it moves around a bit. I don't care. I'll just bring it here to the end which should be well I guess minus 5 the way it looks like minus 5. And now I place the, I bring the plane up again and with the pivot point here on, on one end I place it um, here uh, towards uh, these points. And if you like you can also uh, for this exercise maybe make, turn off the wireframe and perhaps make it semi-transparent with a bit of alpha so it's maybe easier to see that way what is actually happening than with the, with the wireframe. And now I'm placing this through these points, something which is like average in the middle and make sure that the plane extends and I can just scale and because the pivot point is here it will just scale out. So I will scale in the y direction to make it longer to, to, to touch the, these points here and again I can, can see in 3D that it's large enough and also an X so that it really covers the plane. Let me see if it really goes through these points. So here these are now a bit above the ground it seems. So I can rotate, rotate around this axis, around the X axis. So if I just rotate this a little, oops, this is just a tiny little bit. So now this should be relatively good. So I'm, I'm going 
through these points here and I'm hitting the points here at the end as well. So this should be a, a decent reference for, for a start. Um, next part, I want to place some objects to get um, a little bit more of a feeling uh, where, where these poles are uh, in, in, in 3D space and also to calculate the shadows. So instead of using the points themselves, it's sometimes easier to just have some temporary 3D objects. And a 3D object can cast a shadow so I can test with the light what is happening. So I will just put a 3D uh, cylinder here uh, to, to get to simulate this, this shadow and thereby check where the light source should be. So let's bring in a shape 3D, make it a cylinder, merge it into the scene and uh, just by, by view obviously much much thinner and maybe longer who knows but I'll check in 3D as well so it's here it's in the wrong place uh, and I can now uh, maybe select the points here uh, and some, some points down here to, to see so these are on top and bottom of the, of the um, wind turbine so my cylinder should probably connect the bottom and top points here, at least roughly. I don't need to be 100% accurate with this, uh, but if I'm decent with the solution, then I should have something which works for the shadows. Okay. Let's bring the radius a bit down and again I might actually put a pivot point not in the center but somewhere where I have better control so these points here uh, look uh, are, are easy to recognize even from a distance so let me bring the the pivot point up so these are at the end of my cylinder um, so I can bring the I should have done that probably before uh, it works still now I can bring the pivot point up uh, to, to one keep the height on two so now the pivot point is on the top and this way I can now place it with the pivot point to exactly the, these, uh, where these points are. And I can uh, check here in the uh, view as well or even in the final render. So here we have the, the uh, camera output. This is the renderer. Uh, and in the renderer I can, can see where I am here and check this and check the 3D to adjust it a little bit. Bring this below these points. And if this is... Okay, I think this is already uh, accurate enough. Let's look at the, at the bottom. Let me bring again uh, this view in. It's too long at the moment. So let me now scale the, the height. I can just shorten it because the pivot point is on top. It will just shorten the, the bottom and I make sure that it touches the plane. And this should be uh, pretty much good enough. Okay, let me play through it. And I see the cylinder in the, together with the live action footage, exactly sticks to the windmill. This is, oh, this is pretty good. I didn't expect it to be that good. Uh, if, if your solution is, is not like 100%, uh, but only like 80%, it will uh, probably still be enough for, for what I'm doing here. If you have a super accurate cylinder, in theory, I could even use this later for masking, for masking out the, the turbine. Um, but then again, uh, working too much on, on this in 3D, you can also quickly mask it out in 2D, so you have to, to see what is, is faster. But this is already more accurate than I expected and than I need. Um, let me actually, let me color this a bit uh, just to make it uh, more, more obvious. So a blue cylinder, a pink ground plane. And now just for, for reference and to, to be able to uh, get this, this shadow nicely done, I just want to, to place something in uh, the points that are, are here. Is there a point? Well, at least one. 
Okay, so um, let's see where this is in 3D. Yeah, so there are some points here uh, at the at the at the end of this shadow, and I will also put um, a shape 3D there, and I will just put a little sphere there. And I can use this then, my, my shadow should connect then from the cylinder, should cast on the ground and connect to uh, wherever this shadow is ending. So I just now uh, put, put a, um, a little sphere here into it, into, those, into this place. Um, that's definitely too big. And let's give it some, some color. And it should go here, but that's definitely not it. Where am I here? Oh, I'm in the completely wrong place. Let's try this again. I, I should be here, okay. Okay. Uh, good enough. You see the ground plane might not be 100% exact here. Uh, again, also this field might not be 100% straight, but should be good enough for reference. Now, if you want, you could place more things, like maybe place some poles for these windmills, just so to have more orientation in the 3D scene. Uh, not really necessary for this, but hey, perhaps just for the fun of it and to, to visualize this a bit more and make the animation easier, I will just quickly um, add two more cylinders uh, on, on these uh, wind turbines here. And I will just do this quickly in accelerated speed so you're not getting bored. But this is uh, purely optional and not 100% not required. I just copy the front cylinder and bring the copy back to uh, where, these, where these are. Okay, and now I have wonderful markers in my 3D scene, which I can use for orientation and scale and to place things into the scene. Next, I want to take care of lights and shadows, but first let me clean up a little bit. I will save the file now into a new version. If you're following along and want to see the camera track and the intermediate version, uh, you can have a look. But now I will actually remove the camera track and this because I really don't need it anymore. I'm done. I have my camera. I also don't need my point cloud anymore. This was just, I used it for reference to, to get everything aligned. But now I have my 3D scene, which is much nicer. So I remove this. I do need the ground plane. The ground plane for now, let me make it fully opaque so I can judge the shadows better. And let me also bring it, um, that it's, it's not covering the whole uh, image. So let me... Uh, bring it back a little bit here so that it covers everything throughout the scene. Let me also bring these blue and green and red markers uh, in one group where I can easily turn them on and off. So I will just uh, take them all, put them into their own merge. So if I have them in one merge, I can uh, move them easily away. So one 3D merge, bring them back into the scene. And now I will just group this, Control G and call it marker 3D. So I have my markers here uh, and, and I can now, if I don't want them later, I can turn them on and off like this. Uh, I keep my plane and now I don't need this MP4 file here anymore. And now I can add my lights. Let's have a look at the renderer here on the right side, uh, the render view, and I need to enable lighting and shadows here and add my spotlight to the scene. I'm using the spotlight because it's the only light in Fusion which casts shadows. Now the downside of the spotlight is this uh, cone uh, sh shape of the light, which I don't really want. I want more like sunlight, which is like 
directional light actually, but the directional light infusion, there is a tool directional light, but this doesn't cast shadows, so this is useless um, for this purpose. So instead I have to use the spotlight, um, but at least I can uh, put the spotlight far above the scene so that it basically acts like a directional light. So if it's too close to the scene it will like uh, shine out with its cone, but if it's far above then uh, the, the in, in the scene it will act uh, like like parallel light rays, like like directional light. So that's why I'm, I'm placing the spotlight far above. Um, somewhere uh, li like this, so in a, in a good distance above. Mm, I need to direct it at the scene, so you can either rotate it, but I prefer to use the target. Use target, this is usually easier to, to navigate around, so you have here this target marker which you can then uh, place on the ground uh, and move where, where you want this cone to be. Uh, the size of the cone is important, but first let's get the direction right. So I already see some very short shadow here which goes in the wrong direction. So it needs to go into a point like this and bring it at an angle. And now I can match this so that I get my, that I hit here the red point. That's the idea. Uh, and if I do this I should also hit the original shadow because that's what I'm marking here. Okay, so this is starting to look pretty good. Okay, this should be fine. Now the cone, let's have a look at the cone. The problem is if you have a huge cone that means that your shadow is being calculated all over this big cone and that means that the shadow resolution goes down. So there is a resolution which determines on the area which the uh, point light is, the, the spotlight is hitting and reducing that area will uh, improve the resolution. And the second part is there's a shadow map size uh, and if I increase the map size this will also improve the resolution of the shadow at the end. Um, so let's decrease the, the area first and then at later so we can increase the map size if needed. So the cone angle I don't need drop off, I'm, I'm happy with hard edges of, of the shadow and I can reduce the cone angle maybe a, a bit. Well actually I, I can't too much because I still need to get the sides here. Um, I might again work with the, with the uh, target here, um, but, but there's really not, not that much that, that I can do. I can bring the target further, further in maybe. But yeah, so I, I'm afraid there is not a lot I can I can uh, adjust here without uh, losing good part of my shadow. Uh, but like like this, I guess this is what I can do. Let's see if it still works throughout the scene from beginning to end. Uh, my my area is sufficiently covered, so the spaceship I want to place somewhere here, so that should should do it. Okay, this is the, the basic light setup. I will increase the shadow map size only at the end when I do the final renderer. So for now I, I can just uh, keep it like this and I will now take care of the animation of the spaceship. Um, if you want you could just directly bring in the whole spaceship, you know, just connect it here. Um, I know that I do want to do some animations and uh, some, some other things first, so if you have large models you might use some, some simplification first just to have a more interactive uh, feeling while doing the, the animation, setting up the animation. So in this case I'll just do a simple trick. I just use um, I just use one part of the model which represents the, the body of the ship. I just take this part here and just copy it out for now and now I have a, a black and white part of the model and I can uh, just bring this into the scene. So this way I, I don't have to uh, think about all the textures, I don't load the full model and everything, but I just start with the simplified version which will render a bit faster. Uh, and then later I can just uh, replace it and, and connect the full, full model into it. So that's my approach to uh, speeding things up a little bit. Uh, also I will go to proxy resolution, I don't care now about pixel accuracy, I just want to uh, work quickly. Um, and my proxy resolution is set to, to 3, you can even go to 4 depending on uh, 
how it looks, but this should be fine. I have my OpenGL renderer, this is fine. Um, now I need to see where it's in the scene, it's way too large. So let me scale it down with a transform 3D. Transform 3D, you find it in the control spacebar menu and I can scale it down. Scale it down here, scale it down significantly. And I can see in, in 3D in relationship to the wind turbine here, I can decide how large I want it. And I want it fairly large, I think. Now that's up to taste, obviously, if you think this is like a small spacecraft or a large ship, I, I want it fairly large. So I do something like this, uh, this size. And now I want to animate it and I will separate this out. I will just leave the scale. So if I, I want to change the scale later, uh, I can. So I just call this uh, transform scale and I will um, do a separate transform now for the, the animation. So transform, this is now my, my main uh, animation. So this transform I will use to move the ship around and animate it. Let me start by putting it here on the side. And um, by the way, if you want, you could also uh, even deactivate uh, the, the footage for now. So this will be enough to, to understand the, the animation. So depending on uh, your, your render speed and how interactive it is, just keep it very simple for uh, animating and you can always uh, connect it again later. So let me position the ship. Um, where is my control? Here. I transform control, bring it uh, all the way on the ground, somewhere where it's taking off. And I keep the full screen on the right so I, I see how it looks like. And my starting position, I want it maybe a bit at an angle and maybe move a bit further and definitely a bit back. So I don't want it on the level of this turbine, but uh, some part a bit back, something like this maybe. Let's start by uh, setting the keyframes on frame zero. Let me start here. So very simple, the ship is on the ground at frame uh, zero. And then if I play back over, let's say the first 20 frames, I want it to lift up. And let me just do the translation first. So uh, I want it to lift up. Then somewhere around the middle, I want this ship to be behind and around. So I will just position the, um, with the X coordinate, bring it here to the other side, somewhere here. And then uh, I, I set a keyframe here. And towards the end, I want it to come very close to the camera and pass the camera. Now it may be difficult to properly um, position it if it's out of view. So I put, instead of bringing it out of view, I go to, I, I don't go to the last frame, but somewhere uh, close to the last. And here I want the ship to be um, pretty close to the camera and on the way out. And it's too high. Let's bring it in. And here you see it's coming really towards uh, the camera like this. Then I can smooth the animation curve. So let me go into the spline editor. Uh, so at the moment everything is like, you know, exactly uh, linear, which will not look good. So let's smooth this, shift S. And let's see just the the motion going up. Now that's maybe going up and okay, going to the side and going around a turn. Okay, not so bad. And coming here to the corner and then it's slowing down. Now that I don't want, I don't want it to slow down here. So the last point should be linear. So shift L for linear, shift S for smooth, shift L for linear, or you can use the, the buttons here. I use the keyboard shortcuts usually. Um, so here it's now no longer slowing down, but it's now coming to a stop. I don't want that either. Instead, I do a right click here and do a gradient extrapolation. 
gradient extrapolation just means the motion will continue uh, the way it's, it's coming. So it will just continue indefinitely. And this means that it's now moving out of the frame. And it's actually moving out of the frame even a bit earlier than I need to. But let's see here I have the shadow. OK, so the shadow is also moving out of the frame. It's maybe OK. OK, let's review. So not so bad for a first attempt. Now, of course, the ship needs to rotate. So let me do this now uh, separately and start again on frame zero. I have already, let me, uh, so, so first I think it will just uh, rotate around the, the y-axis. I have already set the keyframe. Uh, and as it's lifting up, it should um, rotate in the new direction. And let's see, just this part. That's definitely too fast. So maybe just part of the way. Uh, or actually, let me put the new direction in. But then uh, if I, it, it might start moving and then still rotating a bit. So I can just um, use the uh, Y rotation here and bring it, just move the keyframe a bit. We can also turn on here these markers to see where the keyframes are. I don't want to make accidentally too many keyframes. Um, so I, if, I, if I accidentally click in between, I, I see it and I can see where my main points are. But the rotation and translation might uh, not be in sync everywhere. So I start with a rotation like this. And I will probably smooth this out as well. Shift S to start slowly and then, OK, um, something like this. Then here, uh, maybe I'm, I, I rotate it too far. I need to go in the direction of the curve. So I can just bring this up a bit so that I don't rotate too much. So I'm aligning with the curve. Here in this point, I should obviously go towards the new direction. And even uh, before, it should start turning. And here, let's try to bring the, uh, put a, a keyframe here uh, at the same place. And let me bring this now uh, up so that it kind of aligns with the uh, a tangent of, of this movement. This, and, and you see this is uh, coming um, too fast or too early. So I, I might need either another keyframe or you have to work with these tangent handles. So let's bring another keyframe somewhere in the middle uh, so that or just before the turn starts to, to still keep it in line here. Again, maybe smoothen it. This looks strange. So I go into the tangent handle. So probably the curve should also look look smooth. And then I'm following this curve. This is good. And then towards the end, uh, I, I need to be, again, somewhere from here onwards, I should be definitely facing in the new direction. So let me zoom in and set one keyframe here and align it again. So let's see, is it now really following the curve? OK, this is starting to look good. So I'm, I'm now moving in the right direction. This is quite good. Uh, I probably also, if I look at this view, so now I just followed the curve, I also want the ship to move up a little bit. So again, one direction at a time. Uh, where should this start? Maybe somewhere here when it's going into the curve, uh, then out of the curve it's moving up. So I might put a keyframe mm, somewhere here where, where it starts to, well, maybe a, at, the, at the onset of the curve, maybe I start to uh, move upwards. Um, how do I do upwards? I think it's the uh, x axis, the red one is x. So let's put a keyframe here. Let's check. 
Yeah, so this is moving the ship up. So until here I'm uh, at, at zero and I might just um, single out the, let's uh, show only selected, let's make this easier. And I might just single out individual curves like this so that I don't move other curves at the same time. So I have my, um, not offset, sorry, rotation. X rotation. Here I have the keyframe and then as soon as I'm on the uh, outset here, uh, I should be in my final uh, takeoff direction. So here I set another keyframe and bring this up. Again, let's go back and play through this. Okay. This looks relatively good for the end. Okay, I'm still not 100% satisfied with the beginning. I might have to do some adjustments there. And also I think when it's going through the curve, I think uh, if, if you think like uh, airplanes that use air resistance, now I know this is a spaceship, so, um, but you know spaceships in all sci-fi movies move like airplanes, even though it doesn't always make sense. Um, you know, they, they roll a bit, uh, so, so I think uh, if it, when it goes into the curve, I also want uh, it to, to roll a bit, like, like it's moving against the air resistance. Um, where should this happen? So up till, up till here, probably not. And let me check the rotations again, which one. Uh, now this may be getting a bit difficult uh, because this uh, may now be like a, a combination of, of um, two rotations. Um, or actually, if I change the order of rotation, so at the moment I first rotate around X, then around Y, and then around Z, and the Z rotation here is something which is difficult to handle. But if I first rotate around Z, and then X and Y, let's see. So for now, no change. But now, huh? now I rotate around the Z axis first, and the rest of the movement uh, should still be completely in line. So sometimes just changing the order of rotation solves the problem. So in the beginning I want no Z rotation, then I move uh, through until maybe here where it starts to get into the turn. Here I set my first keyframe on, on Z and let's now only look at uh, the Z path here, even, you know, turn them completely off maybe. Um, and then as it goes into the turn here, I want my, my, my roll to be maximum in the, in the peak of the turn. So I, I bring this up and the wrong direction like this, something like this. And then uh, it stays and then here it should probably be, be rolling out a little bit. But maybe not completely, maybe it's nice if it uh, comes uh, across us in a little bit of an angle, but maybe not not too much, so it's not completely straight. Um, again, probably I need to smoothen this, shift S, and let's see. Okay, before I get lost in the fine-tuning details, let me have a look again how it looks in the combined scene. So let me attach the background again and make the ground plane uh, a bit uh, transparent. All right, and this is how it looks like so far. Not so bad, I think it's like 90% there. Uh, of course, the fine tuning and fiddling and so on always takes a lot of time and I might do a little bit offline and show you my result at the end of this lesson. Um, but all the basic principles uh, are there and just as rough guidance, it can be frustrating, it can take time if you are if you're not experienced with this kind of animation, but just keep it simple, few keyframes, one parameter at a time, think about the one type of motion first, then one type of rotation, next type, you know, and work your way through like this. 
Now I think the overall project we can see where this is going now with the camera track and the shadow even though the ground plane is purple right now obviously that needs to, to change. Um, but next I want to add some, some patch on the ground where the ship is taking off. So here in the beginning I think there should be uh, under the even under the shadow there maybe should be some like burnt ground or some you know some, some mark where the ship is taking off. And this gives me an opportunity to also use the planar tracking here and to uh, paint some patch and matches on, match it on top. And then uh, it will, we will go to the full compositing in, in 2D, bring on the different uh, render passes, the different texture and lights of the model, do some blurs and some fine tuning and so on to make it nice in, in 2D and add some finishing touches with smoke and so on. So there's still a lot of nice stuff coming up, but I'm glad that the basic 3D setup is now done. And from there we can take it forward next week. So thanks for watching and hope to see you around for the next part.